Good afternoon, you all. This is Abrelinha ao vivo, Linguists Online. I am Elisa Batisti from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, and from the Brazilian National Council for Scientific and Technological Development. Abrelin ao vivo, Linguists Online, is an initiative of Abrelin, the Brazilian Association of Linguistics, in cooperation with the Permanent International Committee of Linguistics, the Latin American Association of Linguistics and Philology, the Argentinian Society of Linguistic Studies, the Spanish Society of Linguistics, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the Australian Linguistic Society, and the British Association for Applied Linguistics. Today's speaker is Sally Tagliamonte. Her talk is entitled, What's the Social Linguistics Good For? Sally Tagliamonte is from the University of Toronto, Canada, where she is a professor and chair of the Department of Linguistics. She holds the Canada Research Chair in Language Variation and Change, and she is an honorary visiting professor at the Department of Language and Linguistic Science of the University of York. Professor Talia Monte is the author of books on sociolinguistics and speech varieties. Among them, Teen Talk, The Language of Adolescents, Roots of English, Exploring the History of Dialects, Variationist Sociolinguistics, Change, Observation, Interpretation. She's also one of the creators of Goldfarb C, Goldfarb Yosemite, Goldfarb Lion and Goldfarb X, which are versions of the key methodological tool of variationist sociolinguistics, the variable rule program. Her research projects are about language variation and change with focus on Canadian English linguistic patterns. Uh, welcome to Abrelinha ao Vivo, Linguists Online, Professor Tagliamonte. It's an honor to have you with us. Now the word is yours. Well, good afternoon, friends and colleagues. I'm uh, really happy to be here. I hope you can all hear me. I'm sure someone will let me know if you cannot. So what I want to do today is take you on a whirlwind tour of what I've been working on uh, recently. I hope to provide you with some highlights of how I've been using sociolinguistic fieldwork and methods to investigate language variation and change. This map shows the places around the world where I've done research on dialects of English. However, today I'm going to focus in on the most recent work I've been doing here in Ontario, right there. The communities I've been working on comprise a range of different types. Some are rural, others are mid-sized towns, and of course, there is one really big city, Toronto. These communities also represent situations with varying degrees of language contact, in addition to the intrinsic uh, contribution of dialect preservation and documentation, the research I'm doing provides explicit evidence for analyses of language variation and change, language contact, dialectology, and even has significance outside of linguistics, history, cultural studies, contemporary literature. Taken together, the communities of Ontario offer multiple tests for probing questions of origins, transmission and diffusion, obsolescence, and innovation. Let me begin by saying a few words about variation of sociolinguistics. The field is founded in several main concepts. First, our data is mostly spoken and conversational. We aim to tap into language by listening to the life stories of human beings inside informal conversations. So the data is spontaneous and, and often surprising of character. You just never know what is going to come tumbling out of someone's mouth. Another uh, thing is the fact of categorical perception. 
This is the standard fare of sociolinguistics. When people rely on their own intuitions, variable phenomena are often perceived as categorical. Take, for example, this woman, Bailey Adams, age 55, interviewed in Toronto in 2003. It's usually young females um, when every other word is like, mm -hmm. and it drives me insane. I just like, I hate it. So she hates it, but she uses it. This is standard fare in sociolinguistics. You ask people if they say one thing or another, and they basically deny what they do. There's also the principle of accountability, which means that we're not just analyzing phenomena of interest, but linguistic systems as they emerge in the data. Whatever variants may be used, whether they're standard, non-standard, formal, informal, or colloquial. So for example, suppose we're interested in the use of the English complementizer constructions. We examine all cases where the complementizer occurred, as well as all places where it could have occurred but didn't. Can you see the alternation in this example? Notice that even a single speaker exhibits variation. Then there's this other interesting thing, and that is just because a construction is grammatical doesn't mean it actually occurs. Take, for example, a small house or a little house. There's not much to distinguish these two on grounds of grammaticality. But in usage, one construction is far preferred. Out of 4,802 attributive constructions with an adjectival meaning, small or little, guess which one occurs the most often? a small house occurs 78% of the time, which means that the little English word little hardly occurs at all, which ultimately gives the analyst a great clue that something else is going on. Other issues that frame the variationist approach include the prevailing idea that probabilistic choice is endemic to language but we could also call it layering or competition or even optionality. And this inherent variability can be found at all levels of language, idiolects, generations, communities, regions, etc. Moreover, the fundamental unit of change is not the rule, but the environmental constraint within the rule. Let me now take you to Canada to the city of Toronto, right here. The foundations of variationist work and the nature of sociolinguistic questions as I've just outlined, means that we need quite a lot of data. Take for example, the Toronto English Archive, one of the largest samples I've collected. The corpus comprises, at least at this point, 275 people who range in age from 90 to 92 with years of birth from 1912 to 1994. This much data very strategically selected and sampled to represent a population and a specific place and time makes us able to authentically tap into how language change is progressing. Let's just look at a simple word list of the top 50 words from people aged 60 and over in Toronto. A simple word list like this can give the analyst a preliminary insight into the linguistic behavior of the community. Take for example, a word like, of course, like. Even though this list comes from people over the age of 60, notice that like occurs more than the word is or go. And remember, these are probably the very people who are complaining about young people using like too much. Other words are surprisingly frequent, such as yeah, so, and just, offering once again, clues for the analyst that these will be good places to go hunting for interesting linguistic variables.
However, it's variation of studies of linguistic systems that are ideal for exposing incredible processes of change from one generation to the next, which in turn can lead to many insights, not only about variation, but also about the reorganization of systems in flux. Here are a suite of different changes that were underway in Toronto in the early 2001s, from the oldest generation on the right-hand side to the left-hand side, the youngest, you can see that there are significant shifts in the frequency of forms across generations. I think it's also important to highlight that even small case studies are extremely important. Many insights can be gained from collecting data from a single speaker. Take, for example, the Clara corpus shown here on the slide. Clara was born and raised in Toronto, and I've been recording her every year since 2002. The corpus at this point comprises 134,263 words. That's a lot of material in order to look at how one individual changes across the lifespan. With that type of data, we can probe how Clara's grammar behaves over time. Labov's theory of incrementation predicts that speakers will increase their use of innovations until late adolescence and then remain relatively stable for the rest of their lives. But do they? Let's have a look at Clara's use of the innovation be like, as in, I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, yeah. When we first interviewed Clara at age 16, she had rates of use of be like way high in, you know, 60 or so. Since then, she's graduated from high school, gone to university, entered the faculty of nursing at a local university, and started working at the cardiac unit of a major Toronto hospital where she works to this day. Clara's use of be like, and we're looking at those round circle lines, remains relatively stable, sometimes falling, sometimes rising, However, these differences are not statistically significant. The finding provides real-time support for Labob's model. The perspective also shows us something else that's quite important. Clara's grammar reflects the grammar of the community, Toronto, which you see in the black starred lines. The much larger number of speakers from the Toronto English Archive that I've just described to you are plotted here with the starred line. Notice the parallelism between Clara. So big samples and small samples converge to support each other. But let me turn to the recent project, my Ontario dialects materials. After I had collected the Toronto English corpus, I started wondering about the places outside of the city. Because we know from historical linguistics that outlying areas preserve earlier stages in the history of a language. And in some cases, retain conservative features or innovate new ones. The geographic distance from Toronto in Southern Ontario to the South shores of James Bay is 850 kilometers, a vast expanse with sparsely settled populations. And here it's very important, I think, to think about geography. When I try to explain to my European colleagues that there is absolutely nothing for hundreds of kilometers in Northern Ontario, they ask me, what do I mean by nothing? And I really mean lakes and rivers, moose and bear. I don't mean settlement of human population. Dialects are often not documented. Henry, writing in 1995, notes that the language of the community provides insight into history and culture. So this is where sociolinguistics have a lot to learn from scholars in documentation. Because of the low status generally afforded to non-standard dialects, even descriptive accounts have not been compiled because they have simply been regarded as degenerate versions of the standard. So dialects are often not part of the literature.
Currently, my Ontario Dialects project comprises corpora from 20 different small towns in this expanse of hundreds of kilometers. Comparison across different communities in varying circumstances can expose a whole other dimension to variation. In this context, let me tell you a little more about how my sociolinguistic fieldwork unfolds. What can we do with the type of multi-dialect corpora that I've been showing you? We know that language change can be explained by many social and linguistic factors. Languages diversify as their speakers move from place to place. Change can spread in various ways, sometimes outward, like ripples left by a stone dropped in the water, sometimes hopping from the largest to the next largest city in a predictable order, leaving peripheral places lagging behind. But we can probe other things as well. How about the founders? Were they Scots? Were they Irish? Were they British? Were they European? What about the industrial base of different communities? Farming, mining versus manufacturing. And social networks, are they loose? Are they dense? Are they simple or multiplex? So every year in early summer, except unfortunately not this year, I devote time to taking students on a field trip, an expedition. We head out traveling due north out of Toronto and we go to small towns and villages all over Ontario. People often ask me how I decide where to go. I will typically take up the advice I get from community members and then engage their help in studying a community. In fact, that preparatory work before going to the community is often one of the most critical parts of my fieldwork. Every place has its own story and people tell you the most amazing things. I should stop at this point and tell you that the pictures you're seeing on these slides are pictures that I've taken as we go from different towns. And here you see a very large pulp and paper town of Kapuskasing, and then below the small town of Perry Sound, where my family is from, which is now very much a tourist town. Once in a community, we basically turn into anthropologists. We go, we observe. We read, we experience, we partake in every place and space of the community. Even places like this. You can see in the foreground of this picture, a very tall young man, Andre, who is dancing with a senior citizen at the seniors jam. In the background, you can see someone playing a fiddle and guitars. Every Wednesday, the seniors of the community go and dance and they welcomed our field workers there not too long ago. We find out what's important about the town. We talk to people from a cross section of the population. We enter from different groups, working from our own characteristics. Maybe we belong to a specific religious group or there is ethnic alignment, or maybe we have hobbies that jibe with the local circumstances. For example, in a recent field trip, I spent a lot of time hanging out with the ladies at the, yoga, uh, the local yoga group right there. Another thing that's curious that maybe you don't know a lot about is the sociolinguistic interview. What is it? Well, Lobov says it's a well-developed strategy, but basically, we ask people about their life stories. It's nothing like an actual interview. We record stories about local culture, memorable events, farming and hunting stories, animal encounters, that's a big one in Northern Ontario with all the black bears, childhood games and recipes. Sometimes recent events help us get great stories. In 2003, when we were collecting the Toronto Corpus, there was a huge blackout on the eastern seaboard of North America. The whole power grid collapsed. We asked people, where were you when the lights went out? And it was a great opportunity for people to tell us their stories. 
I'll just read one of these. But anyways, I took off from a parking spot and I noticed all the lights were out and I, I, I never clicked that it was like some massive power outage. Or, so usually there's a hum and suddenly there was no hum. How do you get someone to tell you a good story? Well, mostly it's listening and responding and letting the person talk, asking short questions like, what did she do? And taking an insider's point of view, like, where were you when the lights went out? I don't know, uh, but my kids were on the underground and I was pretty freaked out. Be the learner. If someone is a hunter or a fisherman or a pulp and paper worker or whatever, a cook even, ask them, how do, you how do you bake a pie? How do you cut down a tree? And you can actually learn a few interesting things. Why do we ask those kind of questions? Well, the experiences of history and culture are alive. They live inside us with the imprint of ages emblazoned in vocabulary our vocabulary and our expressions, the ones we don't even know we have. And in the words and expressions we use to tell our stories, those words and expressions are greater than our conscious knowledge of ourselves. And we, when we get people to tell their stories, that's what comes out. That's the language we tap into. A typical sociolinguistic interview is about an hour, but sometimes it's much longer. It's kind of like a ramble down memory lane. The conversation begins with an apparently innocent question. You could say, hey, where were you born? Or who was your first friend? But it can take you just about anywhere. The interviewer themselves has a major impact on the nature of the data in any interview situation. I advise my students sit down, get to know the person in front of you, just like my student Lisa is doing here with an elderly woman in Parry Sound, Ontario. Create rapport and relax into the situation. Take the opportunity to be adventurous and flexible. I always find it's a great experience for my students to step outside of their own characteristics. In some cases, the fieldwork experience can lead to interesting and sometimes hilarious adventures. I'm going to play Jim Milroy's audio clip here. Some of the women would tell her stories uh, about their infidelity to their husband. And the husband would then come in and she'd have to switch it off. And of course, he's talking about his wife, Leslie Milroy's fieldwork experiences. Uh, if you're really keen on hearing Leslie tell you this story, uh, tap into my book, The Story of Variation of Sociolinguistics. It's a hilarious story told by Leslie. So then you have to go back to the university and to the lab. What do you do after the field work is over? Well, we do machine readable orthographic transcriptions. We extract words and expressions and stories we examine features systematically and code them for linguistic and social patterns. And then of course you have to, we're linguists, we're academics, we have to analyze them, conduct statistical modeling like the variable rule program and all the new techniques that are available to us and interpret our findings, hopefully making discoveries that no one else has made before. But we also have to remember to return to tell our story. Metadata, field notes and observations, as you see here in interview reports are recorded in relational databases. Uh, we record sex, age, fundamental correlates, but there can be many others, including education, social network, type of job, and many others. Here you see uh, we have uh, many different occupations, a dairy farmer, a railway superintendent, or a teacher. And we know as sociolinguists that a teacher will not behave linguistically in the same way as a farmer or a railway superintendent. But what exactly differs? A field worker may notice lots of things about the person or the situation. For example, notice that one of the informants has a mother who was educated at the Ontario School for the Deaf. Maybe that has had an influence on that person's language. You never know. 
But if it's in your metadata, you'll be able to find it. Finally, this is one of the favorite developments I've made in the last few years, and that is an inventory of features. As our interviews are completed, field workers are fresh from that experience. And in that moment, they record interesting features they heard and put them into a spreadsheet. In this one, we see an example of good day, a typical greeting in Northern Ontario. To give you a flavor of what this data sounds like, I wanna play you this story about mittens told by Moira Thixon, a 92 year old female. Mother always knit mitts. Of course I do it now, but mother done it then. And I went to school and this other wee girl come down the road the other direction. And when she got to school in the morning, her wee hands were just about froze and she had no mitts. So I gave her my mitts. When I come home, mother says, where's your mitts? She went to put them to dry. I said, well, I gave them to this, the name of the wee girl. I said, she had no mitts and her hands were freezing and I had pockets. No, mother never said, go and get the mitts. She just sat down and knit another pair. <laughs> yeah, that's a good story. Yeah. Just never said anything about it. She knew the wee girl needed. From this complex enterprise arises extensive materials like you've heard here, the life and times of people in context of the community. And from an anthropological perspective, we tap into a lot of other things like culture and history and social information. From a linguistic perspective, we tap into natural spontaneous language and use. That incredible, beautiful vernacular linguistic system. So what did you notice in the story? Well, cultural practice. Uh, when was the last time you wore a pair of home knitted mittens or even ever wore mittens? But that's a cultural practice that's typical of Ontario. You heard expressions like the wee girl and she was froze and she was freezing and storytelling things like says and said alternating in discourse. And you might have also noted just old preterites like when I come and mother done it then and I went to school and this other wee girl come down. And so these are features that we'll turn to in our linguistic analyses. I'm going to play this again. I think I have time to do it. And you'll see that all the features that are in this tiny little story highlighted for you in color or underlined. Mother always knit mitts. Of course, I do it now, but mother done it then. And I went to school, and this other wee girl come down the road the other direction. And when she got to school in the morning, her wee hands were just about froze, and she had no mitts. So I gave her my mitts. When I come home, mother says, where's your mitts? She went to put them to dry. I said, well, I gave them to this, the name of the wee girl. I said, she had no mitts, and her hands were freezing, and I had pockets. No, mother never said, go and get the mitts. She just sat down and knit another pair. <laughs> yeah, that's a good story. Yeah. As an aside, of course, you can't ask someone to remove the grandfather clock in the background that interrupts the story. We also uh, keep a record of local expressions that are often things I've never heard in my life, like I'll just mention one here, the last one on the slide, son of a mope. I had never heard that before. It means a gloomy, <coughs> sulky person. Might come in handy. <coughs> Excuse me. We also find local words like a cow buyer, a dooryard, a lad, otherins. <coughs> words that maybe have not been heard for many years or that we can find in dialect dictionaries. <coughs> Excuse me. There's evidence of founders in minor variants across time. They, as well as major variants, are mostly stable across communities. Take a look at the variants of the adjective 
to mean little, small, tiny, we. You've probably noticed that use of we girl in the mitten story. And it just so happens in the place, Almont, where that word occurs, has Scots founders. And we is a typical Scots word. And so this is one example of how founders leave their mark in a community. We also find local pronunciations, like one syllable spoken as two. Elm tree or elm tree, or maple syrup as maple syrup. Again, aspects of the culture and the landscape. But there they are, those wonderful linguistic features that us linguists like to find. Words like a good many days or the conjunction for, or in the third example, if you wound a bear, he doesn't be very happy, which I would never say, although I wouldn't wound a bear if I were you. Or the alternation of says in storytelling. I says to the guy, look like we've got a problem here. Many vernacular dialects of English around the word contain non-standard verb forms like come in the preterite or done in preterite. And these are the types of things that flag for us features that are worthy of investigation. Let me play for you Roderick Charles, born in 1905. Listen to how many non-standard verb forms he uses. Um. So anyway, the jam started. And the boys was down below uh, there. And I run down on the rocks. And I seen them. And they couldn't reach him. He just come up like that and back down again. And now, we've conducted analysis of this particular phenomena, and one of the most important factors that's come out of the analysis is community. Toronto is not present in this graph because these non-standard uses are very rare to non-existent in Toronto. So let's look at the distribution by the outlying communities. Plotting each group separately, several geographic trends emerge. First, small towns close to Toronto, those right here in the uh, yellow square, have the fewest non-standard forms. Second, the different verbs have strikingly different geographic distributions. Seen in green is the most widespread and has the highest frequency of non-standard forms in every location. In contrast, the non-standard variants of come, give, and done in light blue and purple and red are most frequent in the small rural communities. But there's another thing going on here. Consider the distribution of speakers by date of birth. As you see here, all the vernacular variants are in steady decline. Done, the red line, is rarely used among speakers born after the 1920s. Give, the purple line, drops out among people born after the 1940s. Come, the blue line, steadily falls away across the 20th century. But look at preterite scene, the green line. It remains high in every age cohort, even among speakers born after 1980. It still has a frequency of 20%. Here's another common feature. Do you use someone or somebody? And if you ask people, they don't know. You can see here that for every one of the indefinite pronouns of English, a single individual will alternate between one and the other in the same sentence almost, and the same Continue into contiguous sentences. This is one of our favorite stories about variation in pi. I won't play it because I don't want to take too much time, but just cast your eye down the slide and you'll see that the person telling the story alternates between body and one all the way through. 
And in the end, the interviewer says, no one's gonna turn down a pie. And the informant, the speaker being interviewed says, no, no one turns down a pie. I mean, why would you? If we plot the use of these indefinite pronouns with one rather than body, according to date of birth of the speakers, we discover that there's a steady increase in the use of the one forms across communities. And as the speakers get younger, this trend is visible in every community, rising quickly in the youthful, the young people. And here's another linguistic variant, possessive have. In several studies, I've documented the rise of have in Canadian dialects. Notice that here too, a single individual will use one variant and the other. Let's look at the first one. It has some strength and it's got some character. This variable has an interesting effect. The interesting thing about this change is that as it progresses, linguistic environmental constraints, what I mentioned earlier, constrains the variable patterns. As have becomes the favored variant for state of possession, meaning in Ontario English, old to young, we see that the contrast between abstract and concrete complement stays the same. What Tony Crock has called the constant rate effect. So here the purple bars are my friend has, whereas the blue bars are my friend's got. Moreover, the constraint among different types of pronouns stays more or less stable from one generation to the next as well. By now, there have been many studies corroborating the constant rate effect for many linguistic features undergoing change. I think I have time to tell you about one more linguistic feature. It's interesting because probably many of you in the audience exist in places where more than one variety is spoken and even more than one language. This is the case in Northern Ontario as well. There are certain villages, towns that are overwhelmingly Francophone and the, all, uh, and the mix of population of Anglophone to Francophone is often very, very interesting in the language contact situation. This is subject doubling, a type of leftist location. It's a typical feature of Canadian French, but these examples come from people in Capiscasing, Ontario, very far north of Toronto, and it's used by both Francophone and Anglophones alike. I mentioned that it's a typical feature of Canadian French. If you go to Montreal in Quebec, the French speaking area of Canada, you'll hear it all the time. But on a recent trip into the north to a place called Capiscasing, you can see here on the map, we heard subject doubling all the time, not from the Francophones who did it as well, but also the Anglophones when they were speaking English or French. Let's hear what it sounds like. Alice Cooper, he plays Sudbury all the time. Subject doubling is considered rare in English. So we were very curious when we heard it so much up in Capiscasing. The thing is, it's reported in vernacular speech in the Southern United States. These examples are from Mark Twain's Huckleberry, Huckleberry Finn, the door it slammed, the widow she cried, Jim he grumbled. So we have this canonical feature of French, but it's salient among all people in Capiscasing, whether they're Francophones or Anglophones. Oh and God. this lady waiting in the car, she says, yes, yes, that's a grandma. That's yeah. not a stranger. Yeah. So what we did in this study was to focus on the contrast between mother tongue. What we see here is the animacy effect. Proper nouns, proper names take the doubling the most and places and things take it the least. Notably, Anglophones, the lighter bars, and Francophones, the darker bars, are doing the same thing. Let's listen to an Anglophone here. Our household is French. Mm -hmm. My husband and I, we decided that it was French. 
So my kids were brought up in French. And here's a Francophone speaking English. And it was, it's, it's pretty fun. Like me and my grandpa, we have like a really close relationship. Our household. And it was, it's. However, let's take a look at uh, the critical effect of subject type, partitioning the data by mother tongue. Francophones are on the left and Anglophones on the right. The distribution of subject doubling is shown by speaker age and it's binned into three age groups. Those over 60 on the left of each figure, the 30 to 59 year olds in the middle of each figure and the youngest generation on the right. Proper names are the black bars and all non-human subjects are the stripe bars. You can see that there are striking differences in patterning for the older Anglophones versus the older Francophones. The pattern is coherent within the same mother tongue cohort, but Francophones and Anglophones are not doing the same thing. Now, let's look at the younger people. What happens there? The younger Anglophones are using more subject doubling for human subjects, aligning with the Francophones. And you can see the same alignment for the other subject types. Both show heightened use among the young people. Hmm. So we've established that there are both social and linguistic factors determining the use of subject doubling in CAP. There is a V-shaped curve by date of birth suggesting age grading in the middle-aged speakers of both groups, francophones and anglophones. And there's a shift in linguistic patterning, pretty dramatic shift from oldest to youngest speakers. So what's it all about? Is it contact? Is it a vernacular feature? What is it? What my colleague Bridget Jankowski and I suggest is that English and French contact in Kappa's casing has produced a situation where there's alignment between English and French among the youngest generation. But before we can say for sure that this is evidence for some kind of grammatical convergence rather than a dialect feature, we need to do more work because subject doubling occurs in other dialects of Ontario. Remember that inventory of linguistic features I told you about? Well, that's how we knew because people, our field workers, had spotted it in other places. Okay, let's now take a step back. I've taken you on a whirlwind tour of Ontario. I've showed you a number of different linguistic features. The examination of dialects in time and space and across different types of communities enables us to tap into all kinds of different patterns of variation and change. In the context of Ontario, place matters, generation matters, first language matters, and there's a gold mine of linguistic features of all kinds that can be studied from different perspectives. But let's not forget where our data come from. I wanna play for you Michael Montgomery, who I interviewed for my Variation of Sociolinguistics history book. When we conduct research, we should create an accessible version for other people to study that should be part of our responsibility and we don't talk enough about that when we that lovely southern drawl at the end before i end my discussion i'd like to take up michael montgomery's call what bill labov has called the principle of dead incurred the fact that a uh, an in investigator who has obtained linguistic data from members of a speech community has an obligation to use the knowledge based on that data for the benefit of the community. We're lucky as sociolinguists, as dialectologists, people that go out to the field, that dialects are of intrinsic interest to everyone. Lay people love dialects. I've had a lot of media coverage not only at the national level, but also in the local papers of the places I've gone to. So, looking for true Canadian English there? Go north. Picking Burries, the Ottawa Valley dialect. There's me again. And linguist collecting Halliburton stories for study. I also want to say that Sociolinguists are engaged in returning information about our findings back to the community in ways that are of use to them. 
for each community we go to, we, we produce a book of some of the best stories that people told us. And we send them back to the community with a DVD of those stories. We've also engaged in a lot of community partnerships, producing books in the Tay Valley uh, was example of one of our partnerships. We helped them to, to create those books. We provided the data, the transcription, and we've partnered with museums all over Ontario to do various projects, things that they wanna do in their own community. To end this presentation, I, I want to come back to something that's very important to me, and that is how wonderful people are. I've been humbled over and over again by the thoughtfulness, the altruism, and the sheer poignancy of people's unpremeditated thoughts and ideas. In fact, the Ontario Dialects Project has been the most fun I've ever had, and I really do hope that everyone that I've talked to has had a good time too. There are a number of impacts that this type of sociolinguistic field work and linguistic analysis has beyond linguistics. And here are some of the tangible products. We have searchable databases. I had an author come to me not too long ago and say, uh, do you have any stories about pulp and paper? Uh, and of course I do. And I can search the database and provide that author with some authentic vocabulary. Our metadata is rich with social information. The books and materials we've created for communities uh, inspired by Walt Wolfram's amazing products is really important to the communities themselves. And we engage in community involvement when we can. Uh, you can't get around the student training that comes from this work, not only in field work and interviewing techniques or just simply talking to older people. A lot of times young people don't get that chance very often or to learn how to square dance, for example. But also uh, they learn about ethics, they uh, learn about ethnography and giving back, as I mentioned. Tapping variation in this way in storytelling and life stories are incredible for tapping linguistic features. Uh, single speakers exhibit variation reflecting group network and community norms and spoken language contains discourse pragmatic phenomena and and other features that you're just never going to find in written corpora. And finally, vernacular language and use offers unique insights into history, culture, identity, and other social and psychological characteristics. In fact, what often turns up in the data are features and uses that speakers themselves are entirely unaware of and would never admit to, even myself. And of course, uh, there is always the balance in field work. As you can see here, it can be an opportunity for fun, for sharing and for camaraderie. I would like to dedicate my talk today to the sociolinguists who shared uh, their stories with me and whose voices I have played for you today that have now passed away. Jim Milroy and Michael Montgomery. Thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you to my funders. And I invite your questions and I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Very nice talk. And we do have some uh, questions and a comment from the audience. Let's go to them now. Absolutely. So, this comment comes from G. Spear. Um, he or she says, it's a little disingenuous to suggest that older folks are using like in the same manner as younger folks, simply by virtue of frequency, a frequency list. I think this deserves a comment on frequency and uh, relative way statistics. Well, there are a couple of ways to answer that question. I would uh, defend myself and say it's not disingenuous at all. Uh, we have lots of examples of older people in Northern Ireland and Scotland using like in ways that are very much like the way young people do today. Not at the same level of frequency, but it's there. You can look at Alex Darcy's new book, 800 Years of Like, 
to find out more about those patterns. I often use this example in my undergraduate courses in sociolinguistics. I put up a slide, I put the examples on the slide and I say, who uttered these sentences? And of course, they think they're teenagers, but of course they're not. They're elderly fishermen, uh, miners, people in other places that actually use this feature. Now, the, let me uh, congratulate you on saying that uh, using word frequency material should be taken with an extreme degree of uh, caution. I used it as an example only to show that in some cases, frequency lists are simple to produce and give you a clue, not an answer, but a clue as to what might be of use to study. So thank you for your question. It's an absolutely good one. Uh, but the story of like is long. <laughs> okay, and, and this is a question from uh, James Tratton. Uh, is it okay to do a social sociolinguistic interview for a speech community which you do not belong to? For instance, if you work on a language that you speak, but you are not a native speaker. Such a great question. And I'm sure we could have a wonderful panel discussion about this. Let me begin by telling you uh, what John Baugh told me uh, when I was about to embark on my field trip to Nova Scotia, Canada, hoping to, uh, hoping to gain access to the uh, Black Canadian communities in Nova Scotia. And I expressed to him one day at a conference that very sentiment that you've just described. How can I, as a uh, inlander of my ethnic background, how can I go and enter this community of people who are one of the four founding populations of Canada, ethnically, uh, and, and, and not the same ethnic background as, as I? And he said, Sally, what you want to do is be honest with them. Are you interested in their history? Are you interested in their community? Then be real. And they will accept you on those grounds that you are being uh, authentically interested in them. <laughs> and now let me tell you another anecdote. When I got to Nova Scotia and I actually was able to enter those communities and, and engage uh, local interviewers to do the interviews, uh, one of the things, one of the, uh, my contacts said to me was, um, well, you know, you're not really white, Sally, you're Italian. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sometimes you gotta work with what you've got. So I'd say be, be authentic. Uh, and use some common thing that you share. You know, maybe it's not mm, ethnicity, but maybe it's a love of, I don't know, hunting. Maybe it's playing cards. Maybe it's some other thing. But usually with another human being or a community, you can relate to them in some other way. That's my advice. Um, okay, and um, about practices or some uh, good research practices on keeping data uh, after collecting them. Uh, do you have any advice to give us in ethical terms, in legal terms, and also in order to avoid damage to the quality of the data? Uh, it's a very, uh, very good question. And of course, I don't like, it's not black and white. And, you know, I can't profess to have the best answer to that question. But I try to, um, I would say, be as authentic with your material as you can. Uh, it differs across disciplines. I'm currently working with a social psychologist and th she thinks I'm absolutely bonkers to give my speakers pseudonyms that are consistent with their, their original uh, names. She thinks they should all have numbers. But I'm a sociolinguist and part of my job is to authentically represent communities and so I try to do that to the best of my ability. Um, I also try to give it back to the community because uh, I want it to stay there so that, you know, in four generations, young people might want to hear their great, great, great grandfather's stories. 
Um, but to come back to the practicality of your question, I think it's extremely important to have very organized, uh, well-documented archives so that uh, in time they can be passed on to the next person on down the line. And um, tell us something about your studies. I am curious about them. And one of your titles to be published uh, refers to something as the definite article conspiracy. What uh -huh. is conspiracy all about? Uh huh. Uh, that's a recent paper it just come out. I think it's the bike, the bicycle, and the boyfriend, or something that I've just. Yes. Uh, that was my student, uh, Matt Gardner, who's now working with my, my friend and colleague, Benedict Splexani in Leuven. Uh, I think this is a phenomena that my, my mentor, Shona Poplak, has looked at a lot. And that is that in the prescriptive grammars of our, uh, our history, in the, uh, the things that we read about on the internet, people criticize language and they they tell us things about language without ever really documenting or studying them. And in particular, in, in many prescriptivist traditions, people tell us that you can't do this and you can't do that, or this is a, a bad way of doing things or that people do one thing or another. And in actuality, as analysts, we can take those claims and it's a beautiful thing like this definite article conspiracy that uh, you mentioned. And we can turn that into a, a hook that we can get into the data and find out what's really going on. Yeah. And um, of course you have already showed something about this cross variety comparison. Um, could you tell us more about Canadian English uh, and other varieties of English, you know, innovative features or features that are conservative. Uh, what's this, the, the whole picture of Canadian? Oh, you, you want, uh, I, I, if I could answer that question, I'd be finished my book on Ontario dialects at this point. Uh, so I'll just pick up on a couple of things. I, I mean, the standard view of Canadian English in uh, the 70s was that it was monolithic from sea to sea, except for a couple of pockets like Newfoundland and the Ottawa Valley. Uh, and uh, I have to admit, I was quite a foolish person myself. I, I grew up in the north. I was born uh, very far north in a, a mining town. Uh, really, it's the near north in Canada. Uh, and I just wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. And so I never went back for like, dozens of years. And one day I was uh, giving an undergraduate lecture and I was telling a story like I am want to do. And I happened to use, uh, you know, some vocabulary and I could see the looks on my students' faces. It was a key part of the story was to understand this few words. And I realized all of a sudden it was like a hitting me out of the blue that they didn't understand. And I, I said to my students, well, wait a second. How many of you know what a soaker is? And I was shocked, and I shouldn't have been because I'm a sociolinguist, and I was shocked when they didn't know what it was. And at that moment, I realized I'm speaking a different dialect. I'm speaking with words and expressions that these students in Toronto who grew up here don't know. And that's when I decided to do the Ontario Dialects Project. I applied for funding, I went up north, and I've been documenting these features ever since. The problem is we're all in our own fishbowls. We don't know the words and expressions we use or the phenomena we use that may not be quite like other people. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's one piece. We don't really realize where we are. We have to go out and, and really study the things we do. And I, I even hear myself on recordings and I think, I didn't think I did that. So, you know, we have to be very, um, uh, we have to kind of suck it up and realize that there are things out there that we might not have known. Now, dialects, as I said, are a reservoir for uh, features of language that we may not see ever again. And so part of uh, the process is to document those features. But in documenting them, we can see how different communities are responding to language pressures in different ways. So one community may retain a form longer. Why is that? It could be it could be because of the community makeup, it could be the social networks, it could be, 
but that's our job. That's our job to find out why that is. The sad thing is that many of these dialect features are, are dying uh, in a very big way. And it's not just in Canada, it's in Europe, it's in other countries. And part of our job as, as linguists is to document those features before they're gone forever. Because in most of the communities I've looked at and in broad scale, by the time you get to the night people born in the 1960s, they're gone and they may never return. And so that's why we have to remember we're linguists. We don't want to be too sad because uh, the real key now is to figure out what is emerging. Mm -hmm. Okay, a question here uh, from Carolina. Sadly, we know some about differences between generations, but not so accurate about how can we measure the interval among generations? Can you tell us about it? The interval between generations? Among, yes, between generations, among generations, yes. So I wonder if Carolina is getting at the fact that some generations are really accelerating change. Is that maybe what she's getting at? Uh, one of the things that uh, we're noticing in Ontario, uh, because we have this huge expanse of time, we have documentation of people speaking in the late 1800s, right through to our contemporary teenagers in Toronto. And there are several points in the trajectory where you see a huge acceleration of change. One of those points is not surprisingly uh, just after World War II. And again, there's another surge in the 1980s. So part of our job is to try to figure out, well, why is that the case? Um, is it because we have uh, telescope time? If we had 500 years, would it look more level? Uh, these are the curious questions that we have to have to answer. So generational change is a very big part of what has happened in the 20th century. I don't think it's just Ontario. I think it's all over the world. And I think that has very much to do with how much society has changed during that same period. And so what we need to look at more closely, what I want to look at more closely is what are the, the shocks in the cultural and historical trajectory that have prompted those changes? Um, this is from um, Abhishek Stephen. Uh, did gender play any role whatsoever, whatsoever in the analysis of subject doubling across different uh, age groups? Oh, good question. Someone wants to come and study subject doubling with me. Uh, uh, what we've discovered so far is uh, there is a small effect that men use it more, but uh, not a prominent effect at all. Uh, and this is an interesting thing. Some conservative features are those standard old working class rural men use more conservative features. But the interesting thing we're finding is that some features are not like that at all. My current postdoc, Jeremy Needle, and I are working on the alternate, one of the oldest phonological variables in English, the alternation between hua and wu, and there's absolutely no effect of gender at all. So which variables embody that social distinction and which ones don't? And why is that the case? That's the that's the curiosity I have right now. So um, uh, this comes from uh, um, Miles Jeppers. How can a corpus like Clara's be used to elaborate generalizations of the community? Ah, very smart and interesting question. And so here's my take on it. Of course, I, I will say right off, you cannot generalize very well or effectively or sanely from a single case study, absolutely. But how rare and precious it is that Clara and her sister have enabled me to step into their world and tap into their language for so many years. It's an opportunity that uh, most people rarely get. And so what I wanted, what I'm trying to do in the Clara Corpus is continue to follow Clara. Uh, she recently had her second child. Will that impact her language? I'm very curious to know. 
in conjunction with the bigger Toronto English corpus, we can at least get a little closer to seeing how our, uh, our, our single case study can generalize. Uh, that at least gives us a control. And uh, in a recent paper in the Journal of Sociolinguistics with uh, several of my students, we documented how Clara and the community align and disalign with each other in, in this. And we've taken a stab at, at explaining how that can be the case. Now, of course, in an ideal world, we would want to have 10 or 20 people that we follow for 25 or 30 years. Uh, but I have yet to figure out how to do that. So we, we do the best we can. I think it was Labov that said, you know, historical linguistics is about making the most of bad data. Uh, and I think even sociolinguists that have a large amount of data, we still have to make the most of it, no, how, no matter how big or small it is. So uh, the limitation is there, I acknowledge that, but we make the most of it. A uh, question from Livio Shiro. Uh, can you talk about your fieldwork experience in Toronto in comparison to smaller towns? Are there communities that are more resistant to outsiders? Absolutely. And you know, the sad thing is that it's getting harder and harder to do that. Uh, when I first started doing field work, it was pretty easy to just knock on someone's door and gain access. Nowadays, uh, I mean, let's, let's talk pre COVID-19 pandemic, it was getting harder and harder because people are more afraid and more uh, wary of strangers. Now it's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Nobody wants to talk to anybody and nobody wants anybody else in their home. So uh, the history for sociolinguistics is kind of bleak. That being said, uh, I cannot say how pleasurable it is to sit down uh, with people in their own communities and just talk to them about what's important to them. Uh, and I hope, I, I really do hope that sociolinguistics will continue to be able to tap into these places, uh, small and large towns around the world where uh, people have a lot to tell you and uh, as linguists have a lot to tell us about language. So let's hope things uh, can continue in this way. The other question from Livia was, can you give us tips in regards to how to gain the community's trust especially rural or immigrant communities? Really good country. question. Maybe I should ask Olivia that question. <laughs> we're, we're, doing, we're doing our best. I, I think the best way to tap into immigrant communities is to uh, encourage and uh, nurture students who come into our classrooms, who come from those in immigrant communities. Because the uh, fact of the matter is, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of places I can't go as a middle-aged, basically white, half Italian academic. I certainly can't go where my 17 year old goes uh, into his social networks. He wouldn't talk to me in that way and neither would they. So you have, to, you have to enter into partnership with people who have that kind of access and work with them. Another one from Miles. How can we give back to the community when working with a single speaker? Oh, such great questions. Well, what does that single speaker want? I'm thinking of my, uh, my lovely Clara, who, who's out there in Toronto somewhere. Uh, what does she want? Um, you know, she is just thrilled to be part of a, an intellectual study. She's a highly trained professional. Uh, and it's kind of a, a little piece of herself that she does that she feels very proud of. So maybe there's an intrinsic value of working with a single speaker. Also something that Suzanne Evans-Wagner and I have explored is that when you work with people over a long period of time, part of it is that you share with that other person, like you have a relationship. It's not it's not so technical as to be a number and an investigator. You actually develop a rapport and a friendship and a, and a, a history with that person. So I guess, uh, I don't think you could put a price on 
a good friend. So I think that would be another thing that you could, uh, could do with a single speaker. Okay, Sally, um, we, we've done with, with questions. Good. Um, if you feel like saying some final words to the audience, uh, there are many sociolinguists here saying hello to you in the chat area. Well, I'll, I will, uh, I'll be looking at the chat uh, sometime later. I'm just, uh, I'm happy to have been here and to share some of the things I've been working on and thinking about. I've appreciated the questions. Anyone should feel free to contact me at my email address and engage in whatever other questions or inquiries they might have. And uh, I just wish everyone uh, safe and healthy days ahead. And hopefully we will, we will see each other again in person at a future conference. So thank you for listening. Thank you for asking me really tough questions. I'll be thinking about them over the next few weeks. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you to the uh, Brazilian Linguistics Association for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you for your time and talk, Professor. Thank you to Abrelin, and especially to its president, Miguel Oliveira, and to everybody who has watched the talk. Before we finish, I'd like to reinforce the importance to, of becoming a member of Abrelin so that we can make linguistics even stronger. Please keep connected to the upcoming transmissions and follow Abrelin on social media. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, Sally. <laughs>